Doctors of Reddit, what is a one in a million chance thing about your patient you have witnessed? I put the catheter in, got explosive diarrhea all over scrubs. Catheter goes in crap comes out, can't explain that. Sounds about right. You push on one end and it comes out the other. Either that or you scared the crap out of him by shoving a tube into his dong. I was an intern on the trauma service. A young lady had been in a car accident. I can't remember the details specifically, but she was crashing and an thoracotomy was performed. If this happens, your chances of dying are astronomical. It is truly last ditch. Turns out the accident was violent enough to rip a hole in her heart. The fourth year resident recognizes this immediate and sticks his finger in it literally plugging the dike. He straddles her with his finger still in her heart and she's taken immediately to surgery. He is literally prepped in with her until someone else can get scrubbed to plug the hole. He then scrubbed in and fixed it. She walked out of the hospital on her own power less than a week later. It is the single most badass thing I've ever witnessed. She should be dead, but because of him likely is walking around with no clue how lucky she is. I had a woman come in for her 11th delivery when I was an intern in a government hospital in India. She hadn't had a normal menstrual cycle since the birth of her first child. Kept alternating between pregnancy and lactational amenorrhea. Way down on the list here, but a 16 year old girl came and virtually decapitated after going to sleep at night. Her atlas and axis separated somehow. This is what keeps your head on your neck and lets you pivot it. Pretty much if her head was not supported and fell to the side it could sever the, the arteries. Every doctor in the place was astonished and never even heard about it before in school. I never even found anything on google about another case. Not sure what happened. She was moved to a way better hospital. I was a CT tech at the time. Not a doctor, nor is my family member, but they were the patient. My ho ho, grandpa, long story on the nickname, had his appendix burst when I was about 6 years old. He went a full day of camping with it, and then got pee off that he couldn't drink beer without it hurting anymore and had my grandma drive him to the hospital. Turns out, he has some pretty severe colon cancer, and the cancer growth had essentially held his burst appendix shut or rather together up until that point. He had been tested for colon cancer multiple times and it had all came back negative. And without his appendix bursting it would have likely gone unnoticed until it was terminal. He survived the surgery and beat the colon cancer within the next 2 years. Next year I'll be able to drink my first legal beer with him. And he couldn't be more excited. Heart transplant RN here we had the only patient in the world that this has happened to. Had a heterotrophic heart transplant. Implant a donor heart next to the native heart instead of replacing it, in the 90s. Comes to us with that heart failing, young guy with young kids so we do all we can we stick him on ECMO. Basically heart lung bypass machine. Don't really have an end game strategy because most of these patients don't make it to this part even so the surgeons brainstorm. Decide to implant a total artificial heart. So they implant the tour and so shut the donor heart from the 90s, which is to stay in his chest as it's scarred onto his lung. He recovers from that surgery and then finally gets a second heart transplant, with a kidney. So this man now has two donor hearts in his chest, one not working, recovered and gone home. I was told I had a rare reaction though I don't remember all of it. It started with a standard allergic reaction to an antibiotic. Hives, swelling of tongue and throat, difficulty breathing. I panicked and went to the hospital. When I got there, they gave me a shot. I don't remember of what, likely epinephrine or a steroid, to stop the reaction. Now, I handle pain and take shots quite well but hear me when I say, it hurt. I started cussing a blue streak. I thought the nurse broke the needle off in my butt, where the shot was administered. It hurt so badly, then it felt like someone was turning up the volume on the pain. The intensity went up and up and, every time I though I had a handle on it, it just got worse. Started to feel as if someone injected a red hot pebble into my butt and it was trying to burn its way out. I am not a dramatic person but I jumped off the table, instinct trying to escape the pain. I guess, yelled in pain and even started hoping from one foot to the other in some sort of comical make the pain stop dance. The terrified nurse went to get a doctor and what seemed like all the night shift doctors came into my room. I don't remember clearly what happened over the next bit due to the pain but finally one of the doctors told me I was having a rare reaction to the shot. 
So rare, in fact, they had only read about it and most doctors never see it. I think they stated pain medicine wouldn't really help unless I wanted opioids. Opioids scare me more than pain. So I'm guessing that I turned them down. The pain lasted for 2 weeks at varying levels. I will still get that shot if I ever need it but that pain makes an anaphylaxis death look tempting. Yo dog, I heard you have an allergic reaction, so I gave you a shot to treat your allergic reaction, which gives you an allergic reaction. A nurse here, one of my veteran docs, who is a former army doc, and I were caring for a patient found face down in, and I'm quoting the paramedics, thick, nasty goop outside of his home. Medics intubated on scene and when he arrived we found he was having signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. I cop from here out. Neurosurgery came down and walked with us to CT scan, looked at the images, and had me run back to prep a crash room for an emergent ventriculostomy. Thank god it was a fluke weekday night where he was our only emergent patient. It was early in our flu season and late enough so that we were fairly empty for a little while. We got everything set up and the support staff in the room. My tech wheeled the patient in while the neurosurgeon scrubbed up and the adoc prepped to be a secondary support. The procedure went textbook but we still couldn't get his IGP under control. Neurosurgeon gives us strict care orders to minimize stimulation and increasing IGP. Including only using a specialized Yankor device for oral suctioning around his ET tube. As we're getting ready to get him into the IQ I attempted to clean him up a little and get some of his airway cleared of the aforementioned goop. My suction device suddenly stopped working and when I examined the end it had a pair of maggots stuck. I yelled for the adoc. Neurosurgeon already went to his dictation office up in the IQ to look at the patient with me. He took the yankor and a cotton wound probe and found a tunneled wound in the patient's upper jaw. Neurosurgeon was called. Guy went to MRI. Entent plastics were brought on board, and patient was taken to the OR. My nearly permanent flat affect a doc followed up with IQ nurses a couple days later when he came back on shift and told me, I've seen horrible crap, I've seen war injuries, I've been in stupidly disgusting shitholes around the world, I've never once vomited with anything involving a patient. I tell you that to give you context for my next statement. A maggot in the mouth patient, birthed flies and more maggots from a separate tunneled wound that couldn't be fully visualized on the MRI. It went all the way to his brain and one of his sinuses is involved. I've never, ever, seen crap like that. I'm pretty sure this story was quite famous at the time, at least here in Australia. I grew up in a small country town, about 2 hours from the nearest major hospital in Melbourne. My mum was the nurse in charge of the little country hospital. This happened probably 20ish years ago so the details are a little sketchy. A boy hit his head, I think it was skateboarding or bike riding. He was initially okay, but then presented to the O with loss of consciousness. A being 3 beds in a room as big as my lounge room. With one doc on call, doctor realized he had a bleed on the brain, and the pressure had to be released, otherwise the kid would die. Problem was, he was not a neurosurgeon, had never done brain surgery, and the kid had to have the surgery right now or he would die. The hospital was also not equipped for such surgery. The doctor rang a neurosurgeon in Melbourne, put him on loudspeaker, and knew he had to drill into the skull to relieve the pressure, but there was no equipment. So he got the drill from the maintenance closet, like, a hardware drill from Bunnings, sterilized it, and with the verbal instructions from the neurosurgeon, drilled a hole in the kid's skull to relieve the pressure. He had to do it in exactly the correct spot, and if he went too far, the kid would have died anyway. He succeeded. The kid was taken by helicopter to Melbourne once he was stable enough. I don't know what happened after that. But as far as I know, he survived with no long term complications. TLDR. Unqualified doctor used a hardware drill to relieve pressure on a kid's brain. Kid survived. I had a patient who would have discrete episodes of confusion, speech difficulties, and balance disorders occasionally for years. Full workup W imaging, labs, eagle without diagnosis. Specialist at a tertiary facility ultimately diagnosed him W variant seizures, but the anti-epileptic RX didn't help. Symptoms got worse, 
Wife calls in for support because he is suddenly profoundly altered, and we send him to the air. Now, this guy doesn't drink at all. No, really. But surprise his blood alcohol level was ridiculously high. I diagnosed him W auto brewery syndrome put him on a carb free diet, and his SX vanished almost immediately if he has fruits, breads, carbs, he will predictably develop a bag, even under strict observation to make sure he is not drinking. Is he hiding alcohol usage? No, because if he were someone with that kind of alcohol usage, you would expect to have relapses. Instead, he and his wife are the most happy people you could imagine. Not a doctor, but the patient who is a one in a million. I got diagnosed with a bone infection. 200,000 cases annually in the United States. It's some infection that settles in the bone and just incubates until I had some physical trauma to the area and it basically burst out into the surrounding soft tissue. I'm having a surgery on it next Thursday to aggressively clean it out and put in an antibiotic bead. My sister is a pathologist and she once found out her patient had spongiform encephalopathy, similar to mad cow disease. She had to remove the brain and send it to I believe the Mayo Clinic. Also, while she was in school, the doctors were about to start treating a patient with chemo for something that was thought to be like brain cancer, and she figured out it was actually a fungal infection and saved that patient many rounds of unnecessary chemo that wouldn't have worked anyway. One of my clients is a surgeon, said the craziest thing he's seen was that his patient's heart was backward. There was no record of this and he was shocked that nobody caught it. Not a doctor but my mom for years complained that it felt like she was sleeping on a tennis ball. One day she's in pain and keeps dry heaving the pain is so bad. She still feels like she's sleeping on a tennis ball and so we take her to the hospital. The pain is horrible and she's describing it as worse than childbirth. Take her to the nearest hospital. They give her pain meds and tell her to come back Monday. She keeps taking the meds and it's not improving. It's getting worse. Sunday comes and she can't even move the pain is so bad. Once again, she feels like she's sleeping on a tennis ball. We take her to another hospital. It's further away but it's our we don't know any more choice. Doctor does tests, scans, etc. He comes to us and says she has an ovarian cyst the size of a softball and that that same ovary has been twisted. After a very long surgery, the cyst is removed. It was a little bigger than a softball and yes, the ovary was twisted three times. Rotating through neurology as a medical student at UCLA, we had a patient brought in from LAX airport, who'd collapsed on a Trans-Pacific flight from Japan. He essentially stopped breathing, and wasn't moving his arms and legs. We did a massive workup with MRI and CAT scans of the brain and spine, blood work, spinal taps, ETC etc. Nothing looked wrong. But he remained unable to move, breathe, or do anything. Finally after a week in the hospital, we found the cause. He'd brought a bento box on the flight of sashimi made from fugu, aka blowfish. The chef that had prepped it obviously had done a bad job, and the fish's poison, a potent paralytic, had tainted the sashimi and slowly paralyzed the patient after he ate it on the flight. He luckily hadn't suffocated before the flight touched down and the waiting paramedics could intubate him and bring him to the hospital. Obligatory not a doctor but my third child had a super rare disorder that is literally one in million. No one at maternal fetal medicine knew what they were seeing. I unfortunately had to terminate the pregnancy because she had severe brain and heart defects as well as very distinctive craniofacial defects. The doctor who did my abortion had never seen anything like her and he has been doing them for decades. I ended up diagnosing her myself after seeing her because I had to know what did that to my little girl and if it was likely to recur. We confirmed it with genetic testing. Turns out she had acromelic frontonasal dysostosis. It's a rare form of frontonasal dysplasia with 18 previously documented cases. It really sucks she had to be that one in a million. Not me but my wife. She had a patient with a colostomy bag. The colostomy hole had an STI in it. I'll let your imagination figure out how she contracted the STI. This happens way more than us nurses want to acknowledge. Ro, not here to mention a one in a million medical case but to thank Reddit and their community for making this question. I'm a general practitioner and most of the cases and experience here are really educational. Please do it again Reddit and doctors of Reddit. Thanks. 
I had a serum amylase of 5280, normal is 8100. A pancreatic exploration was done surgically and revealed a perfectly normal pancreas. Doc had no explanation for this. Not a doctor, but my best friend is a med student. Told me he saw a patient with congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis, and it's apparently an extremely rare disease, 11000000 are the odds of having it. It's where you feel no pain at all and you're unable to sweat, so you can hurt yourself without knowing it. Or if in a warm place, your body overheats due to not being able to sweat, you have to be in a cold room with no sharp edges. The specific case my friend has was a girl that's 3 years old. Apparently her brother also had it and he died at 4 years old. They die super young because of the disease. Sad stuff. I am not sure if the person I know of can sweat, but my friend's boyfriend cannot feel pain. He is in his 20s. Not the doctor, but the patient. I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and my only summer was in the center of my bicep. Of all of the places NHL shows up the bicep never really considered for a solo tumor. That's not even accounting that a 23 year old had NHL to begin with. My oncologist had been practicing for 30 plus years and had never seen NHL show up on a bicep until me. So the odds of a 23 year getting non-Hodgkin's lymphoma located somewhere other than a lymph node is stupid rare. Former EMT firefighter here. Got called out for chest pains in the middle of the night. Arrived on scene to find a mid-twenties male presenting with all signs and symptoms of a heart attack. Strange for someone so young in our area. Loaded him up and started heading to the hospital. 45 miles away. Code 1. Mid-transport. Mid-sentence. Dude straight stopped talking. Looked us dead in the eyes and said I'm about to die. Eyes rolled back in his head and dropped down onto the gurney. Load the gurney. Checking pulses and monitors. No pulse. Starting CPR. We realized his eyes were back open and he was looking around the ambulance. We stopped compressions and checked for a pulse. Eyes stopped moving and no pulse. WTF. Start compressions. Eyes open. Looking around. He tried to say something along the lines of goodbye during compressions but he couldn't gather enough breath as we were smashing his chest to keep him alive. Stopped compressions. V-fib. Defibrillate. Drugs. Resume compressions. For the next 30 minutes this ensued until we arrived at the hospital. As I was writing the report, the doc came in and expecting to hear that the patient expired, he said instead well, your boy is alive. He's being transferred to cardiology but he's back to normal sinus rhythm. The look on our faces must have said something. Because the doc turned around on his way out and said he should have died. I don't know how he didn't after being down for so long. But he didn't. Good work guys. As an 18 year old EMT, this absolutely floored me. Come to find out he had an aorta dissect. But the hole was small enough to allow some blood flow during chest compressions. He underwent surgery and fully recovered. I'm not a doctor but when I had my son 31 weeks via emergency c-section, the doctors later told me that he had no pulse when he was born. They worked on reviving him immediately. I couldn't tell what was happening because there were about 8 doctors surrounding him, and had pretty much given up hope after about 5 minutes but weren't going to stop. At 6 minutes he took his first breath. The doctor said he'd never seen a baby that early come back after being flat that long. Today, my boy is 6 and completely healthy. No long term complications whatsoever. He was a champ in the NICU for 45 days before we took him home. I couldn't imagine my life without him. Not a doctor but was a paramedic. I made a cardiac arrest. Middle aged male slumped over in a large recliner. Wife was understandably distraught. I had a very incompetent EMT assistant that had picked up my shift and I dreaded depending on him for anything. I told him to help me getting the guy to the floor so we could start CPR. True to fashion, he dropped the patient's upper body and I was left holding his legs as his back hit the stone floor with a loud thud. The wife started to scream at him and lose it. About that time I noticed he was spontaneously breathing. I figured it was just agonal respiration but sure enough, the guy now had a pulse. But now, reviewing the incident later, I've had plenty of people suggest he just needed his airway repositioned or that he wasn't really in arrest to start but I swear, I checked him myself. 
I repositioned his airway prior to moving and the wife confirmed he was pulseless and a panic for at least 5 minutes before we get before we get that leads me to just one conclusion. By dropping the patient's torso, my incompetent partner basically gave the guy a reverse precordial thump and reset his heart. I still had to write him up and document what he did but I also credit him with accidentally saving the guy's life. I'm not a doctor but my twin got sepsis from being already sick then getting his teeth cleaned at the dentist. He had literally zero signs until one night like a week later he started puking and passing out. He went to the hospital got antibiotics and came home fine 3 days later. Hospital calls the night he came back home saying to get there now cause he has spasis but isn't showing signs which is really rare. If he hadn't gone to the hospital that night they said he would have probably died. Not a doctor but my youngest son was being scanned for a respiratory condition he has called tracheomalacia. It's a floppy airway that causes a lot of coughing and for him choking on food. Basically whilst scanning him they noticed an enlarged blood vessel or similar in his neck which they followed up into his brain. Finding a large AVM which is like a pocket of blood where a vein and artery had decided to grow end to end. As it turned out his condition is caused by a rare genetic disorder called Rosa 1. He also has red marks all over his body where the capillaries don't do what they should. The end of one of his fingers looks like it was trapped in a door because it is so red. He is one of 10 kids being treated at a very good children's hospital in London. We were told if it wasn't for the initial scan for the tracheomalacia then they likely wouldn't have picked up on it until it burst. Still makes my blood run cold just thinking of it. He had two surgeries to close off the AVM and will need scans every 5 years. The other bonus is he was under the age of 4 needing all this done so hopefully won't remember any of it. Happened to a friend of mine who is a doctor in cardiology. They have a weekly workout session with work, which is very common around here. Most workplaces organize something like an hour of indoor soccer or floorball with the colleagues every week. As they finish their session one week and walk out the door from the training facility an aged man comes jogging by. Suffers a cardiac arrest and promptly falls into unconsciousness literally right in front of every expert in cardiology in the city not currently manning the hospital. Needless to say, he recovered well. Not a doctor but when I was an EMT, I was in the emergency room of a major trauma center when I heard paramedics call the Tridge nurse to report they were en route to the air with a severely hypoxic, low oxygen, 50 year old male. The air staff assembled in the trauma one room. Docs, RNs and respiratory therapist on hand waiting for the patient's arrival. Medics arrived and I saw the patient was blue. Not just blue lips or fingertips, but blue all over. Like Papa Smurf blue. His vital signs were normal, including his O2 sats. The docs were stumped. Well, little brand new EMT me spoke up and suggested the patient was taking silver supplements. Funny thing is I had recently read an article that said silver supplements were good, but too much would turn your skin blue, and it's permanent. The docs looked at me like I was high, but asked the patient if he took silver supplements. Why yes he did, lol. I was on an IQ rotation and had a patient that had been in a coma for 3 days with a life expectancy of 24 hours and no chance of waking up get approved to have his dog come say goodbye. His family from all over was in the room. The dog was licking his face and he woke up for about 60 seconds, only saying the dog's name and petting it. I lost my crap. I have never cried to the point of leaving a room. The gentleman passed 2 hours later with the dog curled up on him. I can't shake that crap from my memory. Something in him woke up to that dang dog and it's still making me tear up thinking about it as I write this. When my mother was in her end of life coma, we were all gathered to say goodbye. No reactions at all from her. But when my father kissed her she tried to respond. He was shattered. Just said I didn't realize she loved me that much. It broke us. Patient here. My dermatologist has been practicing a long time and he said he's never seen this happen before. So, I had a dysplastic, precancerous, mole removed. They send the sample to a pathologist to make sure they got it all. I go back for a follow up. The nurse reads the report, goes quiet, and says she needs for the doctor to come explain the results to me. Fun. That's never good. I wait 15 minutes, alone, getting increasingly anxious. Finally, the doctor and his wife, also a doctor in this practice, come in together. Double fun. This can't be good. 
They sit down at the computer and discuss for a few minutes quietly, in German, which I can't understand in rapid, quiet murmurs, and finally explain the pathology report to me. The small sample of my skin that was removed due to the precancerous mole also randomly contained a basal cell carcinoma, so my doctor accidentally removed cancer while trying to prevent cancer by removing precancer. Well done, doctor. P.S. If you haven't gone in for a full body skin cancer screening, call and make an appointment. Go every year. This is your SAR for the day. 3. Obligatory not a doctor here, but, my mother had an acoustic neuroma pushing against the right side of her brain and it fed on estrogen hormones. Well, she and my father used IVF, in vitro fertilization, to have my twin and I so she was pumped full of hormones and it caused the tumor to grow to roughly the size of a large egg. So when my sister and I were, luckily, born prematurely she was in the hospital for about 3. 4 weeks because she'd started having seizures and hallucinations. The effort of having two freaking babies may have been a bit much at the time for her. So on Halloween she went into surgery. Turns out she had a few problems with the surgery. 1. The doctor who told her he'd done this many times before lied. This was his first time with a brain tumor like that. So he scraped her brain while getting it out and basically caused irreparable nerve damage to her face and caused her to go blind and deaf on the right side of her face. 2. She had a stroke on the table and basically had to learn how to speak, write, walk, and do everything again. The doctor told her she should be happy because he thought she was going to die on the table. She's alive and well now and when she got her bad eye removed, it caused her too much pain on top of the nerve damage. She was so happy she got a puppy. His name is Ollie. He is a dumbass and I love him. My cat had an insulinoma, a pancreatic tumor that overproduced insulin. There's only been about 10 or so documented cases. He got sent from our vet, to a feline specialist in the next county, to the supervet specialist for the country. They performed surgery to remove the tumor and incredibly, he recovered and wasn't even diabetic afterwards. He died about a year later when we discovered brain and bone cancers, probably spread from the insulinoma, but his case was phenomenally rare. They brought specialist vets in from all over to look at his case. I specialize in transgender care. A male to female transgender patient told me they felt like they got cramps monthly like a woman on their period but that they went away once they went on HRT. I thought nothing of it. Eventually the patient had gender affirming surgery and during the surgery the surgeon discovered that they had an underdeveloped vagina and uterus inside the pelvis as well as tiny ovaries. The patient also had a penis and testicles. Karyotype of the patient's blood came back 46xy but of the uterine tissue 46xx. The patient was a true chimera and the fusion of fraternal male female twins was an insanely rare case. I still can't believe it happened sometimes. Originally we were hoping the uterus ovaries would have been functional as the patient could have both fathered and bore children which I'm pretty sure would be a medical first but unfortunately the organs weren't viable. I have a friend who was born into six declared male at birth, and only discovered this fact when she, she has since transitioned to female, began menstruating through her penis during puberty, and I will never complain about my cramps again after hearing that. This will probably get buried, but this is such a funny coincidence I figured I'd share. Not a doctor or the patient, but my dad was the patient in this one. He had a tooth extracted and they had to place an implant in the wound while they waited for it to heal a little before replacing the tooth. About a month and three weeks later he gets a killer sinus infection and he suspects it's because of the wound in his mouth. We went to the dentist today and they did an x-ray. The implant somehow managed to dislodge and burrow around the jawbone and make its way into his sinus, causing the infection he's currently taking antibiotics for. The dentist said it was a one in a million scenario. Interestingly this happened literally about an hour ago and suddenly this thread is in the front page. Life is funny that way. Anyway, he's having the implant removed on Monday. Weird, same happened to my dad. It's supposed to be really rare man. I'm a nurse practitioner. I had an elderly patient come in and admitted to the hospital for heart failure and pneumonia. During her stay we noticed she had a hard time eating. She would cough after everything we fed her so we ordered a swallow study to evaluate her ability to safely eat or drink. 
turns out she lost her bottom partial dentures 3 months ago. These showed up and there's Ray's sitting very snugly in her esophagus and had been sitting there the past 3 months. Family was glad we found them. I don't think I'm allowed to answer if I'm a patient but whatever. I got a cut on my heel and it was pretty nasty but it wasn't horrible enough for me to go see the doctor. Fast forward a week and the pain had spread from my heel all the way to my calf and my mother finally looked at it and there was a red swelling from my heel to my calf. We went to the doctor and they said it was a staph infection and it had actually spread to my kneecap and were talking about amputation. Basically the one. One zero 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 zero. Chance that saved me was one of the doctors on my treatment prescribed some new antibiotic that I can't recall the name of and were worried that if my infection spread or was antibiotic resistant they would have to amputate before it spread even further. Thank god that the infection receded and I made a full recovery, but thanks to that doctor I did. The only symptom I still face is chronic knee issues in my right knee where the infection just destroyed my meniscus. Still allowed to answer, I'm happy that you are living with relatively little complication. I've posted this before, but it's relevant. My mom was a piano teacher, and had a student who broke her femur playing soccer. Full speed collision with another girl and it just snapped. Yuck. Anyway, she was having tons of problems in the hospital. Coded twice. Respiratory issues, etc. I remember watching an episode of House after the Super Bowl where he diagnoses the woman in Antarctica. The issue was an improperly set broken toe, which was throwing marrow into the bloodstream. I mentioned this to my mom when I heard about it. My mom mentioned it to the girl's mom. The girl's mom brought it up to the doctors. LOL no way. The girl coded again. And her mom made the doctors check. Yup, improperly set. Thanks house. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. for now.